This is where I've been for the last month. <laughs> when not in bed and not at therapy. This is what I call my mom cave, although really it's far from a mom cave. It's at one end of the house, uh, apart from everything, but it has two walls of windows from floor to ceiling overlooking my backyard. So it's one of my special favorite places. As you can tell, my colors of blue and yellow are my favorite combination of colors. My white wicker that I love. You can see some of my plants. There are others gathered around. It's a place of comfort for me. You can see the quilt, and I don't know if you can tell, right in front of the quilt is the heating pad that alternated with ice packs and got lots of use in the last month. My stack of books pretty much stayed right there. <laughs> I didn't read very much, um, had big plans. And on the kind of coffee table is my water that I drank and drank and drank. Um, I've been told that you're supposed to drink 64 ounces um, a day, and I did more than that every day in that big mug that the hospital gives you. And then at the edge of the coffee table is my healing oil that Joyce gave me to rub into my knee multiple times a day. This, for me, was a place of comfort. This, for me, was a place of presence. As I absented myself from all of you and from the rest of the world, this is where I was, and it was a place of presence because I was there and God was there. And that was enough. What I needed was given to me each day as I needed. And so envision me in my place of comfort, my place of presence, my place where God would visit me on a regular basis. Today's story, also in a small intimate room, is a story of healing. As Mary anoints Jesus' feet with oil and then wiping his feet with her hair, an unheard of intimacy in preparation for his upcoming death and burial. While we often pray for healing of disease or grief or loss, we have a hard time accepting death as a form of healing. And while not discounting the awful torture of Jesus' death, remember that Jesus' death results in the most extravagant, most abundant gift of new life that God promises us, the gift of resurrection. Today, I focus on God's extravagance, symbolized by the extravagantly expensive perfume that Mary uses, and the promise of water in the desert in Isaiah that Kate read, when we feel trapped on the shifting sands of our temptations. In our Lenten sermon series on temptations, we've wandered through the desert of temptations. The temptations to think we're not strong enough or faith-filled enough. The temptation to believe lies. The temptation to believe in the illusion of control. The temptation to give up when things don't go our way and the temptation of entitlement, that invisible backpack that we carry. Today, my challenge is, are we tempted to view life as scarcity, not enough resources, 
or just barely enough to satisfy? Or can we trust in God's promises of abundance, extravagance even, beginning with God's love for us, that God would entrust his only son to the cross. Father Richard Rohr says, the cross is a statement of what we do to one another and ourselves. And he continues saying, the resurrection is a standing statement of what God does to us in return. How often are we tempted to trust the cross instead of trusting in God's desire that all lives should be full of well-being and wholeness and shalom and abundance? Do we live by a value that our resources are finite? and that we should clutch and scramble to hold on to our share of what we think we've earned, whether it be through good behavior or successful careers or long lives. I believe that God has a different perspective. Some examples. First, my knee. It's far from healed and the process is painful and slow, as many of you know. But even in the worst of the pain, usually in the middle of the night, I trust in complete healing. Even as my physical therapist pounds me with pain-filled exercises, I believe her when she reminds me that my once weak knee will be the strong, fully functional knee, not subject to the deterioration that comes with aging in my other knee. The extravagance of my healing isn't some magical, sudden transformation, but a day-by-day -day process of being lifted up in prayer by you all, eagerly awaiting the afternoon mail, bringing the encouragement of your cards, working hard on my therapy, trusting medicine's wisdom, and probably most importantly for me, surrendering myself to rest, even though that is contrary to my very nature, and then retreating to my mom cave for peace and for comfort. My temptation has been to be scared and to give in to my fear of never ever being completely healed. The extravagance and wonder of my healing is that I submit myself in trust and I receive just what I need each day. And in my month-long spiritual discipline, this has been more than enough. In John's story of Mary anointing Jesus with Chanel No. 5 priced oil, <laughs> Judas does not trust God's providence. Judas protests that the money spent on oil could have been used for the poor, a legitimate concern, if only it were true. But the gospel writer assesses Judas's character, saying, Judas said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus is very clear about his priority when he rebukes Judas, leave Mary alone, and as he accepts Mary's intimate devotion and care gratefully, knowing that she'll be present to the end. And the perfume of Mary's love for Jesus and the love Jesus had for Mary filled the room. 
What about the promises God makes in Isaiah 43? When the Israelites, led by Moses, flee the Egyptians who had enslaved them, they come to the barrier of the overwhelming waters of the Red Sea. How does God provide? God makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. And perhaps more relevant to today, when we wander in the desert of our temptations, God promises to provide rivers and water in our wilderness. In a literal reading here, we can think of the drought in Kansas and the Midwest, and although the recent snow and rainfall aren't enough to erase the devastation of the drought, Cannot our attitude toward what rain we do receive be an attitude of gratitude? And speaking of drought, we think of the many children of poverty whose numbers of food scarcity, a euphemism for hunger and starvation, and the increasing numbers are overwhelming. I think of Carmen's recent observation after the recent snow days of no school when she said, although the children's behavior may be wild and unruly as they return, at least they'll be fed breakfast and lunch again. We might despair of making a difference, but I would argue there is enough food it's just not distributed equitably. I can't argue solutions to the complex challenges of poverty and hunger. But I can argue that a temptation to despair is a temptation not to trust God and God's desire for abundance for all. When we adopt God's vision of abundance, we're motivated to challenge systems of unfairness and oppression and work to make changes. For example, VIDA, our Topeka Hispanic or Latino ministry, has a shortage of volunteers to work in the nursery and in the homework center as Hispanic adults strive to learn English and make better lives for their families. Sure, not enough volunteers represents a scarcity. But if we turn our perspective around, can't we give thanks that there are so many families submitting to the discipline of ESL, English as the Second Language, in their vision of finding a way through the wilderness of our American culture? In response to the abundance of these families, we're challenged to respond with our abundance. And when I look back at the last couple of years here at Trinity, I see that we have trusted in God's extravagance when we called an associate pastor, and when we built the education wing and updated the building, trusting in a capital campaign following the project. Some would say a blind trust, but our capital campaign is 51% of the way toward our goal in less than a year. And now we plan to renovate Fellowship Hall. Unexpected gifts have rolled in that will make this financially possible. In fact, I'm aware that gifts totaling $41,500, $41,500 from various families have been received in the last couple of months above and beyond stewardship and capital campaign pledges. God challenges us with abundance. God challenges us with abundance. 
Will we hug these monies to ourselves and accumulate them like a bank? Or will we be faithful to God's vision of abundance, challenging us to use our monies as faithful disciples? I look forward to the discussion in session this Wednesday evening when Kate and Martha lead our elders in a discussion of our perceptions of mission at Trinity and how we respond with our abundance, especially our abundance of people resources, wherever there is scarcity. Just as Judas betrayed Jesus, giving in to his lust for money, how do we betray Jesus when we give in to our temptation that we don't have enough to share? When the world around us screams scarcity and we hunger for reassurances of enough, how do we resist settling into our comfort with the status quo? What are the barriers that stand in the way of following God's lead? How do we as a congregation listen to God's call away from whatever enslaves us? whether that is prosperity or poverty, success or failure, growth or decline. How do we trust that God is doing new things in our midst so that we can move into our future with trust that there will be enough? when we look at how God has lavished us with life-giving water in the past, can we trust our future to God and the new things God may be doing? When we trust in generosity and share our abundance, can't we just smell how the world is filled with the perfume of God's love? transforming the stench of death into the fragrant hope of new life. Thanks be to God whenever and wherever we trust in God's extravagance. Amen.